Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And these lessons are for the months of April, May, and June of 2014. This particular series is entitled Christ and His Law, and this is lesson number 10 in that series entitled Christ, the Law, and the Covenants. So all of you are experts on covenants, I'm sure, but we'll have to talk a little bit about what a covenant is. This is the lesson for June 7 of 2014. And I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to be looking at a number of Bible verses all the way from Genesis to the, probably all the way to Revelation. We'll see how it works out. Um, before we begin, however, as we usually do, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's such a great privilege to associate with you, to think about you, to study about you, to take this opportunity to encourage others around the world to think about you at the same time. Forgive us where we have failed to maybe understand and follow along as we should have your guidance from Scripture. Be with us now as we talk, talk about law and covenants and how Christ was involved with all of them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so as we've already suggested, this is a lesson about covenants. <clears throat> what are covenants? That's kind of an old-fashioned word, isn't it? It involves agreements, promises. Um, it's a good legal term. It's a good Find legal it in, term. in legal documents. Yes, yes. It usually has a degree of being binding. Yes, it's intended to be binding, exactly, yeah. Well, God has made some covenants with human beings down through the generations. What would you say was the first sort of covenant that is mentioned in the Bible? Probably Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 is probably the first. Now, that's not set out in legal terms, but God more or less promised there to Adam and Eve right outside the Garden of Eden that he would provide a remedy to the sin problem. He didn't de give much details, but uh, it was a, that's a kind of an agreement. The next one, the one that usually is mentioned as the first covenant in the Bible, would be the covenant with Abraham. Uh, that's in Genesis 12. And the well, and, and some people regard the God's promise to uh, Noah in Genesis 9 as a kind of covenant, and that, that's fair enough too. Um, the covenant. That, yeah. that was the that was the rainbow. Yeah, well, that was the the rainbow would be the sign of the covenant. God's yeah. promise that he wouldn't <clears throat> he wouldn't uh, flood the world again. So those will give you just a little hint about what kind of covenants God was involved with. But uh, let me ask you a question in your Bible study guide. If you have one handy, one prepared by the church, the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Saturday of May thirty one. It has this comment. Though the Bible speaks of covenants in the plural, and there are some places, Romans 9, 4, Galatians 4, 24, and Ephesians 2, 12, there's really only the covenant of grace in which salvation is given to sinners, not on the basis of their merits, but on the merits of Jesus that are offered to all who claim those merits by faith. What is the relationship between merits and covenants? What are merits? How do we claim them? How are merits related to covenants or even promises? Or, or I guess the more basic question would be, do we need merits? Well, I used to get merit badges. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, I used to get demerits. Demerits, I see. Is that as good as a merit or is that? <laughs> it's kind of like a celestial salvational bank. I see. In, in, in one or two church regards yes you earn you earn something in your account mm -hmm. and if you have too many or you have uh, some that spill Expert. over you can th those can be taken and used to uh, and call you a saint and yeah. give you. you you could share with other people yeah uh. it's kind of something that you that you possess or have uh, that entitles you to something it may not be uh, a tangible thing but uh, generally that 
I think that's a, a reasonable definition for a, well, for a marriage. For many, many years in the Christian church, the idea was that God is using a balance. <clears throat> and you have your good deeds on one side and you had your bad deeds on the other side. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, you're in. And if the bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, you're in trouble. So if, if you were afraid that you don't have enough good deeds here, then you pray to one of the saints or somewhere up the ladder there and you pray for more merits and so maybe your good deeds will now outbalance the bad deeds. And so are we really saved on the basis of how many merits we collect? No. Well, think about that. We'll come back to it later in our discussion. I agree with Yoli. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Does uh, any, do any of God's covenants require us to have merits? in order to enter into or keep the covenant? Is that well, something we should keep in mind? The interesting thing is that I don't find merits mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Well, how about good works? Are those the same as merits? I think so. How about Genesis 17, the covenant with Abraham? Okay. And he says, uh, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to circumcise your, yes. uh, first, your males. Yes. And that's going to be a sign okay. of the covenant between me and you. And he was God's going to make uh, Abraham a father of uh, many nations, or a multitude of nations, the RSV says. Mm -hmm. so. Well, but still that's, that's still a sign. It's not, it's a sign of the, of the covenant, and the covenant is the thing that contains the merits. Well, the covenant in this case is, I'll be, I will be your God, and you be, be, will be my people. That's uh, okay, really... Is that, okay, so where do the merits come in? Mm -hmm. Well, we, it's fair enough we should talk about two basic kinds of, of, of covenants. What are the two kinds of covenants? Conditional and unconditional. Okay. Okay, well, you need to... Yeah, you, know, you gave me two more long words to, oh. to, 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 to <laughs> explain the, the long word I was trying to understand. Anyone else can help you, Oli? What's the What are the two kinds of covenants we have in the Bible? Well, to confound things a little more, you have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have conditional, unconditional, old and new? Yes, okay. Are we Please guessing? help me somewhat. Are, are we guessing correctly? No? You have covenants between two people that come to a mutual agreement. Okay. That's a, okay, that would be an agreement, uh, something like that, okay? And then you have covenants where an authority figure says, I will do this and you if, do that. If you do such and such. <coughs> okay, so like the government says, um, we will protect and care for you if you pay your taxes. And even if you don't pay your taxes. <laughs> okay. So one has if in it and the other one has, well, well we'll just do the, it? The difference would be one is a sort of mutual agreement. You and I might be, you know, might come together and agree on something more or less as equal partners and we can negotiate or whatever. The other one is someone in authority writes everything out and you have, oh, the only choice you have is yes or no. I was going to say there's a level of choice, it can yeah. be positive or negative. Yeah, it's not nego <laughs> the second kind is not negotiable. Not so sure. the other kind, you do have more guns. Yeah, I mean, but, why? But let how me, else would I, a person be able to do that unless he had he didn't have guns or some sort of power over somebody? I'm I'm not sure I'm comfortable with if you have no choice, it's a covenant. I don't. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe well, that's yeah, a legitimate yeah. definition, but to you, me, you a, a, a covenant is where you 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 have an agreement. Yeah, yeah, that's true. The the, the agreement in that second type of covenant would is yes, I will, or no, I won't. If, I'm, if I say, no, I won't, then I'm not a part of this covenant. Yeah, you sound like a politician or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I think the other one, though, you can, you can have two farmers agree to, to help each other out under certain circumstances, and, and, and it's okay. But then one of them, a month later, might think, I was a fool to do that. Yeah. And if he refuses, then the other guy can go in legally. There is a mm -hmm. bit of a difference there. Yeah. Well, as a parent, if you have a wayward child on drugs, out of their mind or something, you could make a promise. I'm going to take care of you even if you don't love me, appreciate mm -hmm. me, keep um, doing this. I make a choice 
And would that be a covenant then? I have, I'm promising that I'm going to take care of my child uh, no matter what. Yeah, I mean, that would be usually in a ca case like that, you don't have to get any kind of a si signature on the bottom line because you, you're sort of doing everything. By the way, is, does God ever make those kind of promises? I think that's what God did to us. We were kicking, screaming, uh, going around a golden calf and doing everything else. And how many, how many sinners, inclu including all the way up to Lucifer, are, uh, the former Lucifer, Satan, are being kept alive by God right now? Mm -hmm. uh, all, us, of all, all of them. All of them. All the ones who are still alive are being kept, to God, kept alive by God. Well, th as some of you have already hinted at, Often covenants have some kind of a symbol connected to them. Maybe it's just a signature. What about the Genesis 9 covenant? Shall we look at that real quick? Genesis 9, look at 12 to 17. As a sign of this everlasting covenant, which I'm making with you and with all living beings, I'm reading from the Good News Bible, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be the sign of my covenant with the world. Wherever I cover the sky, whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. That is a sign of the promise of which I am making to all living things. Does God need a rainbow to remind him not to flood the earth? No. Well, I hope not, because if there's a drought, he might forget, and, <laughs> and we'll be in trouble. Okay. We need, we need the reminder. Okay. So you're saying the purpose of God putting the, the rainbow up there is to remind us that something happened. And hopefully it won't happen again, right? Well, we, we have a firm belief that it won't happen again because we have God's promise. Maybe it's a reminder that there is a God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 And of course, um, technically, the scientists would say, where does the rainbow come from? Water Refraction droplets. Of, yeah. of light through water droplets. Yeah. Refraction, right. So that doesn't have anything to do with God. So what's this God business? What does God have to do with a rainbow? God made light and he made water droplets. Did water droplets have to be made so they would refract light? No. God no, could have made... Can you can go over and say, you know, as long as uh, that tree stands over there, I will love you. Mm -hmm. You can say that to your wife. Um, you know, you can, you can kind of just pick out things that are going to stand forever or a long time and, and make that kind of a pronouncement. So well, wh why, why do you think rainbow was a good covenant sign in this case? There was no rain, and there was no reason for a rainbow before the flood. Exactly. And after the flood, the earth was such that um, it creates rainbows now. This is a new situation. Mm -hmm. oh, it was a good symbol, too, because it, a bow, yeah. like, like a fighter that, with his bow and arrow. Yeah. He, he, when there's no more war, he hangs it up on the, the wall. I, I, you it's know, like I'm hanging it up in the sky, the, yeah. the <laughs> rainbow. Oh, nice. I hadn't thought about this before, but uh, if we understand that there was no rain before the flood, yeah. then, and we're going to have rain after the flood, mm -hmm. every time it's going to rain, people might be afraid that, well... Is the next flood coming? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. So uh, every once in a while there's a rainbow thrown in to kind of remind us. That, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I... And what do you think that, I mean, the question, I, I, the, you know, I, I always try to put myself in these Bible stories. What do you think uh, Noah and his family thought when they saw that first rainbow? Especially after the first heavy rain. I was going to say, <laughs> I think the flood might have caught their attention first. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they were something new. But what was the sign of the covenant with Abraham? Circumcision. Jim, you, you mentioned that. Okay, circumcision. What kind of a sign is that? Pretty Permanent. Pretty basic. <laughs> pretty basic. Yeah. A peculiar one. <laughs> a peculiar one. About five verses here uh -huh. on, more on, on, on that subject. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, 
Does circumcision have any obviously spiritual implications in our day? No. 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 Well, to some people, some... I think there might be a fringe in yeah. that. Yeah. Orthodox. Yeah. yeah. Orthodox Jews still yeah. see it, yeah. Should women have some kind of sign that they're part of this, or why do only males mm -hmm. get involved? Well, there are parts in the world, Africa, yeah. where they force women to do yeah. this. What they call it that, but that's yeah. what they do to women mutilation. Is, yeah, what they do to women is mutilation, it's not mm -hmm. circumcision. Mm. Yeah. Well, the male is the head of the household. So he does that on the behalf of the family? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, may maybe a male had a problem. Yeah that uh, needed to be mm -hmm. remedied mm -hmm. and and um, so well ju let's just say that the male is stronger than the female mm -hmm. so there's there's kind of signs there when you when you get circumcised that mm -hmm. um, you're you're kind of um, getting back to uh, equality or something well not equality but um, uh, Letting something go that mm. so that they can come back together again. Uh, there's 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 possibilities there. Well, uh, you can you can make what you want of this, but um, some scholars have suggested that um, the Jewish males were were being circumcised because in those days, remember, fertility was worshipped. I mean, and 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 we we sort of smile at that and we think how crazy but stop and think about it if your life depends on your plants growing and your animals reproducing it's not too hard to see why they would be inclined to worship fertility but uh, of course they carried it to extreme <laughs> lengths there were male and female prostitutes and so forth and one suggestion has been that the Jewish males were circumcised so it was harder for them to go incognito to these uh, fertility cult affairs and uh, you know even in the last minute someone might say hey you aren't you a Jew you know so it was a it was a protection for yeah. those Jews who might have tended to forget yes now I read were. some history that um, that circumcision wasn't just from the Hebrews no I mean it was happening all over the place but there were in fact the Egyptians had a kind of circumcision was just just a slit so what the, all, not all circumcision was the same. But uh, the tools they used, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seems like it would come out the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, having looked at some of these covenants in the Old Testament, uh, how do we understand some of the covenants in the New Testament? Look, for example, at Galatians three, starting with verse fifteen. What what, what do you understand is going on here? My brothers and sisters, I'm going to use an everyday example. When two people agree on a matter and sign an agreement, what would we call that? Contract. That's a contract. That's a covenant. That's a promise. It's a so no one can break it or add anything to it. If it's done and sealed, done. It's it's an agreement now, unless the two people come back together and say they want to modify it somehow. Now God made His promises to Abraham and to his descendant. Singular. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people but the singular descendant, meaning one person only, namely Christ. Christ. What I mean is that God made a covenant with Abraham and promised to keep it. The law, which was given 430 years later, cannot break that covenant and cancel God's promise, for if God's gift depends on the law, then it no longer depends on his promise. I mean, if God promises something and then he later says, no, I guess I'm not going to do that unless you keep all the Ten Commandments, well, the first promise was gone out the window, isn't it? If he promised to do something, now he's not doing it. Except he's added conditions. That's the first covenant is just, it's ceased to exist or ceased to be functional. However, it was because of his promise that God gave that gift to Abraham. What then was the purpose of the law? And of course, many of you will recognize that this is a very um, important question in the history of Seventh-day Adventism. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is. And it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, and again that singular notice, 
to whom the promise was made. The law was handed down by angels with a man acting as a go-between, but a go-between is not needed. Only one person is involved and God is one. Does this mean that the law is against God's promises? No. I mean, if you come along and say, well, now, you know, the thing I promised you before is not valid because now I'm giving you new rules. Does that mean you just did away with the covenant? Paul says, no, not at all. For if human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin, and so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who believe. And then the, the punchline really here in the last few verses, but before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came. Now, it's interesting to notice that there's two ways. Well, the Greek says literally, and so the law was in charge of us to, uh, uh, um, unto Christ. It says literally, the law was in charge of us unto Christ. Does that mean until Christ comes or to bring us to Christ? And you can see obviously that depending on your understanding of the purpose of the law, you're going to have a different understanding of how to interpret that verse. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. It is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus. You were baptized in union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ Jesus, Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women, you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. And you, you said a whole lot there. <laughs> that was hard to keep up with. Yeah. Can you summarize it again? The mm -hmm. well, yeah. covenant... Um, <clears throat> what it says here is that when God made his covenant to Abraham, he said, this thing is going to be fulfilled by a descendant. And of course, that would be Jesus Christ. And what was God's covenant with Abraham? What did he say he was going to do? He said, basically, I'm going to give this whole land to you and to your descendants. Okay, and you will have children like the stars of the sky. Right. And this is going to be fulfilled through your descendant, which was Well, Christ. through your descendants, but the, the ult uh, and, and so that's where you decide, okay, does that mean until Christ comes? Or does it mean, you know, to bring us to Christ? So it depends on how you, but both of those would be, in other words, this is a covenant that I'm going to have with you people until a certain point. And the point is going to be when Jesus Christ shows up. But in there, the law, after the covenant, the law did not affect the covenant in any way. The law was just given for our, um, uh, help, to help us live better. Well, the interesting thing is, when was the law given? Do you remember where it's found in the Bible? Why, do, why, why did those people need a covenant? Exodus. Yeah. What people? Well, why did they need this covenant before, well, before God was, Jesus? And now Jesus comes, and so we've got something else. That, that doesn't... Uh, I know it reads there, but it doesn't... To me, it seems like God is, God is the same from the beginning to the end of things. And this well, old stuff and new stuff, and well, we've got to have this now, but then when Jesus comes, we've got something a little different. I don't... Uh, what, what happened? What, what's God Good old Paul about? there, but something's confusing to me. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, let me see if I can clarify it. God said, I'm making a promise, Abraham, to you and your literal descendants. That promise, I'm going to work with you as my special people until Jesus Christ comes. Well, why, did, why is that? Because what happened three and a half years after Christ died? Well... God said, I'm taking the gospel to the whole world, and I'm no longer exclusively working well, with Well, but he, he wanted the Jews to take the gospel. He wanted the Israelites to well, take the whole gospel to the whole world to begin with. Exactly. So why... And did they do it? Well... Well... A few examples like Jonah. So what's, what's that got to do with... What's that got to do with the... 
with the covenant coming and going, it's because they didn't take the gospel? That, uh, yeah, of course. But it's like he, he that, that's almost as if he's saying, well, I'm going to set this covenant up with you for a while, but I know it's not going to work, so we're going to change it later on. Well, when Jesus what? gets here, we're going to know, well, it's not working, so. Yeah, that, I mean, what, what, that a covenant, remember, a covenant is an agreement. I'm going to do my part, and you're going to do your part. If you don't do your part, what happens? After a while, 1,500 years later, you finally say, man, I guess it's not working too well. Let's try something different. Well, why did he make the covenant in the first place? Because he wanted that he wanted to inspire them to do something. Can we follow the line? I, I'm still like we got <laughs> cut off in midstream here. Mm -hmm. So God had the covenant mm -hmm. and uh, with Abraham, mm -hmm. and then uh, God did the law uh, at, okay. after uh, the Exodus. Yeah. And the law was just to help us do right living. It didn't. It didn't break any of the covenant. No. But then explain how then the law transferred into faith when okay. Jesus. Well, I don't know that we should say the law transferred into faith. Look at, look at, there were other sort of agreements that came along. People tend to look, the people in, in, in Jesus' day and so forth, they tended to look back to the Sinai covenant as opposed to the Abrahamic covenant. And remember the Sinai covenant was very interesting. In Exodus 19, which is a chapter before Exodus 20, God says, I'm going to give you my laws. And what was the people's response? Everything you say will do. Yeah. Exodus 19, 8. They hadn't even heard God's laws yet. And they said, all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. Sounds like a lot of faith to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what more could, could God want? Exactly, and how well did it work? Well, so what did they do time. in Exodus 20 then? Well, the law was given in Exodus 20. And then we're talking about the Ten Commandment Law. The Ten yeah. Commandment Law and so forth. And, and what Paul is saying to us here in Galatians is the fact that some of these other things interposed doesn't change the fact that that original promise was there. The original promise to Abraham. To Abraham. Question. But he, yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. In contract law, like, you know, regular law, there's a notion of meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. To have a real contract, you and I have to understand the same thing. Mm -hmm. Does that apply here? Because if the covenant was given and most of the people didn't get it, mm -hmm. is Good it still question. valid? Yeah. Good question. Is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. What's the answer to that, Ken? <laughs> well, I mean, how, 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 how... She's asking, how can this be a legitimate covenant okay. if, if there was a misunderstanding, if there wasn't a true meeting of the minds? Yeah. Okay, but you, you missed one ma major point here. Who was the original co covenant made between? God and Abraham. God and, God and Abraham. Abraham. Did Abraham understand that God was planning to give him seed, that is, descendants, that would inherit the land. Yes. It's going to take time. Absolutely. He understood, and he understood it was going to take time. So I wouldn't say it's fair to say that that, in that, see, we're looking beyond the Ten Commandments. We're looking back to Abraham. Well, but there was a spiritual application to that as well. It yeah. wasn't, you're just going to get this territory. Um, this is going to be, a, there's a spiritual application here Absolutely. as well. This is going to be, Something. Are you saying all these covenants are like the Mississippi River? They start with Abraham, and all these covenants are just part of this river that flows from Abraham. All the covenants are... are and they add to the river as it goes along. Uh -huh, but yeah. it's still the, the head of the Mississippi River The headwaters river are still with Abraham. Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I remember there was this, this girl, this little girl that I took to the store with. I don't know what it was for, but she had this phobia that people were gonna leave her. Mm -hmm. So when I was at the store there, I said, well, I'm gonna go look over here. You can, you can look at the toys over here. And she would say, you're not gonna leave me, are you? You're not gonna forget me, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, yeah, I'm not gonna leave you. Don't worry about it. But she was worried about it. Mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of things to tell her that no, I am not going to leave you. I am going to come back and pick you up. I am not going to drive away in the car without you. Mm -hmm. And so 
in a way, that's how I kind of see this covenant of God, that he's telling people mm -hmm. that he's not going to leave us, mm -hmm. no matter what. And, um, and so that's kind of how I see it when I come across it in the Bible. We don't, we, don't have to, we don't have time to spend a lot of time on this, but how did Abraham and God seal that first covenant? Do you remember? <clears throat> a lot of animals shed blood, cut in half. and They took animals, laid them out, killed them, laid them out, cut them in half, set them like this, and then Abraham went into a deep sleep and God appeared to him in vision. I mean, what a gory kind of business. What was that all about? Well, that was a blood cover. Was that standard operating procedure back then? <laughs> it was pretty much, if you're having a major covenant, in fact, if you look at the Hebrew, the, the, the word for making an agreement in Hebrew is to cut a covenant. Okay. Well, so they were cutting, and didn't they walk through? And they walked through between the two. The, the, now, the, that one's pretty serious, though, isn't it, when you do that? Because yeah. aren't you saying that if I fail on my side of the bargain, you can kill me? That's the implication. That's, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at that time when God went through the, between the two animals mm -hmm. that were cut, Abraham didn't have to. Uh, you read it. I yeah. read it a couple times. He didn't have to. It was just God. And yeah. sure enough, the covenant wasn't kept, and look who had to die. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot of lot of thinking you can do about that. Yeah. Now refresh our minds. Why did God choose Abraham? This probably isn't our topic, but yeah, was well, he the is. only righteous? Why why did God well, choose Abraham? Well, but let's look at the history of our world. God starts out with Adam and Eve. They fail, and per before too long, he has to send a flood. And he starts over again with Noah. Before too long, he has to start over again with Abraham shortly after the Tower of Babel. They're all back just about as bad as before. Now he starts over again with Abraham. He works with Abraham for a long period of time, and he finally has to give up on the children of Israel, and he has to focus on Christians. Then for a while, after a long period of time, he has to give up on all Christians, and now he focuses on Protestants. And you know, it goes on like this. How many times does God have to sort of start over? Do you think he's going to have to start over again now? Are we going to let him down? I certainly hope not. Mm. Well, we know that the first sort of covenant back there in Genesis 3 happened outside the Garden of, of Eden. And what happened outside the Garden of Eden in that covenant? Sacrifices. Sacrifices. How do you think Adam and Eve felt as they had to kill that first lamb? Horrible. I mean, what did they kill it with? I mean, someone, no one gave them a, you know, a buoy knife to, to do it with. Was it a sharp rock? I mean... Kind of gruesome, I think. Pretty, pretty awful, yeah. And I think Adam might have said to God, you know, this is making me sick. And God says, I hope it always makes you sick. That's in, I mean, this is a, this is a, a symbol to try to convince you how serious sin is. That's the point. But we know, unfortunately, as, as people grew more and more sheep and got more and more comfortable with killing them and eating them and et cetera, et cetera, it was, well, if you've got lots of sheep, why, uh, you know, spare a lamb, that's okay, that's no big deal. And pretty soon, by the time of Jesus, it had almost gotten to be a circus at the temple. A question? Yeah. If God was so against killing that lamb, why then, when Abel and Cain um, brought their offering, but the offering that he preferred Abel's? I mean, that's a good question. Why do you? Th what do you think is the answer to that? Yeah. I think we're missing something because why would he? Pre because okay, it's always intent mm -hmm. uh, because of the heart and intent. But Abel's uh, offering had a killing involved in it. Mm -hmm. When when uh, uh, Cain's did not. He had mostly yeah. vegetables and stuff yeah. like that. God, God had <laughs> laid that down and, like, and Cain just ignored it. Yeah. I mean, God is trying to tell us that sin leads to death. <coughs> I mean, do you think, oh dear, I just killed this vegetable? 
Yeah, but you know. No, but you, but I always, <laughs> I had a, even as a child, I used to thunder on that. But Cain was a farmer. He yeah. raised vegetables. What he had. So if he needed to get a a sacrifice, he would have had to go to his brother to get it. Or that parents. doesn't seem quite right. Or there seems parents. like there's something yeah, right. right there. God told him what he wanted the sacrifice to yeah. be, how it was to be done. And Cain says, huh, I got this. Yeah. Deal with it. Yeah, that, that's that. my point. Yeah. If God is against the slaughter of animals, why did he tell him, okay, well, do this and that? That's the but point. The, the point is that God is trying to tell us that as, sure. as serious as the point of as sacrificing animals is, that's how serious sin is. That's what he, I mean. We don't think it's any big deal to pull a carrot out of the garden. You know, we don't, that doesn't seem like any big deal to us at all. But sacrificing a lamb, I hope, would always be considered serious. Now, when we live our lives and we're sacrificing, I've sacrificed a lot of things, but I haven't killed anything doing yeah. it. So why why would any of my sacrifice be acceptable to God if if I didn't kill anything? Well, I mean, and that's a good question, and, and that depends on what you think happened with the covenants and, and why you think Jesus had to come and live and die. Did, he, did his life and death answer questions that make the sacrifice of animals no longer necessary? I and mean, that's a long discussion, which we don't have time the for right now. The sacrifice... It was a process. It was a symbol. Mm -hmm. And we have different symbols for that now. It's the communion service is our symbol. Mm -hmm. Jesus died, and that was the sacrifice. And prior to that, we had a very graphic example of what was going to happen. And now we... we well, but maybe a, maybe a, a <coughs> successful human life has sacrifice in it. Yeah. I mean, normal. Okay, but let's, let, let's, let's get back to focus on what the lesson is really talking about. There are a lot of people who feel that somehow or other, for example, by keeping the Ten Commandments, if I work hard enough and I keep these Ten Commandments, I'm going to earn my salvation. And Ellen White made some very interesting comments about that. This is one is found in the Use Instructor um, of September 22, 1892, paragraph 1. The spirit of bondage is engendered by seeking to live in accordance with legal religion through striving to fulfill the claims of the law in our own strength. There is hope for us only as we come under the Abrahamic covenant, which is the covenant of grace by faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel preached to Abraham, through which he had hope, was the same gospel that is preached to us today, through which we have hope. Abraham looked unto Jesus, who is also the author and finisher of our faith. So what does all that mean? Well, let's let's look at a different kind of covenant. We've talked about lots of sacrifices and kind of stuff. What about the so-called new covenant in Jeremiah 31? Now we're still in the Old Testament, but this is called the new covenant. The Lord says the time is coming when I will make a new covenant. So who called it a new covenant? God Himself, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Now, that would be the covenant of the foot of Mount Sinai, right? Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. So if two parties agree and one party doesn't keep his side of the agreement, what happens? It's invalid, right? The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. How much do we have to do to participate in that covenant? Love. <laughs> That's it. But not love as we understand it. Mm -hmm. Because I watch, sometimes I watch programs and you'll see someone say, oh my God, I love him so much, but he slept with my sister and he beat me up and he doesn't work, but I love him. I never get it. And that's not love. It's something else, but it's not love. We have to understand. So uh, explain, if you may, the difference between the way we love and Jesus' level of love. Okay, well, 
Let's take a moment to do that. In the Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, there are four words for love. There's a sentimental, if you will, uh, an erotic kind of love, which is eros. That's where we get our word erotic. There is a <clears throat> passionate kind of love called epithumia, which, and epithumia can be almost any kind of passion. It could be even anger. There is then a, a, a brotherly kind of love called philos, from which we get, of course, Philadelphia, love, the city of brotherly love. And then finally, there is agape love, which means love that's a principle. You, you love people because they're brothers and sisters of our, you know, uh, and, and children of the Lord. You love them even if they're completely unlovable. So that's a principled kind of love. And so that's what we're talking. We're not talking about those other yeah. kinds of passions and eros and that kind so of stuff. So God is a principled kind of love? Yes. So this, this new covenant you just read about in Jeremiah, mm -hmm. um, once again, I, I don't, to me, God's always been that way. Okay. I don't see that it starts at any place, it's, at any time. It just seems to me that that's that's the way it's been. That, the, the first well, we said the, the first problem that Adam had at the tree, God manifested that kind of a covenant yeah. to Adam and to a Abraham and to everybody ever. Yeah. So that's why what, we said back at the beginning of our lesson, there really ultimately is only one covenant, the covenant of grace. So this, what I mean, it's a new covenant. I'm going to do this when well, you've been doing it all along. Hold here. on, you people keep, keep forgetting what you read in the Bible. Did the people in Jesus' day, did a lot of people in Jesus' day believe that they could be saved by keeping the law? Yes, absolutely. If a lot, do we have a lot of people in our day who think that they can be saved by having more merits than demerits? Maybe even Abel believed that. That's why he offered that sacrifice. Okay, so do we, do we need to straighten things out? Can you tell me the difference? There's keeping the Ten Commandments <laughs> mm -hmm. by our own strength. Mm -hmm. And keeping the Ten Commandments because God has given us a new heart that loves his law. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you tell the difference between a person who is keeping the Ten Commandments to earn his way to heaven versus one that is joyfully keeping the Ten Commandments, skipping their way through life because God has given them a new heart. What is, how can we tell the difference? One is sweating and the other one isn't. <laughs> <laughs> we the can't answer, tell the difference. Yeah, yeah the, yeah, answer, the right answer is probably that we can't tell the difference. It's God who can tell the difference. I mean, because people say, don't keep the Ten Commandments because that is just working your way to heaven. But when God gives you a new heart, mm -hmm. you want to. And you're going like, don't tell me that I can't do something that I want to. Mm -hmm. Which of the Ten Commandments do they mean not to keep? Not well, you just to always... To not murder? That is murder okay? Is lying okay? They, they just seem to say you're saved and you don't even... You don't even try. Well, it's 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 Why fine. It's fine now to kill and to steal and to lie. They don't go that far, but they say, just don't do try go? to keep the law. And what that they say is keeping. Is keep the laws except the Sabbath, right? That's that's probably true. Yes, except <laughs> all of them except the fourth. Yes. So so this new covenant comes along to to. Bec because um, there are people who believed in the Old Testament, you asked the question, that um, uh, by, by working you could have all of these merits. So all the people in the Old Testament, there wasn't one person who didn't... Now you know that's not true. Well, I'm, but I'm just, I'm just trying to follow along with the, with, the, with the logic of the discussion here. Okay. So if this was, why is this so necessary when there were just as many people back then who were, knew the right what was going on as maybe there are today? So what, why are we trying to solve a problem today that isn't more easy, is, is just as difficult, to, isn't any more difficult to solve today than it was back then? So what you're saying is... Four thousand years later, we still haven't solved it. Well, I have. I don't know about <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's take another place. Look at I Hebrews nine. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, one more. Um, yes, people have said 
why do you go to church on Saturday? You don't have to keep the law. So I guess that's what I was getting at because I don't have mm -hmm. many Adventist friends. And I actually feel that Saturday is more fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And it's like, don't prevent me from doing what I want to do. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, and, and so, but in their eyes, it's like you're being a legalist. And I'm going, no, it's my joy because I feel that it is a different lifestyle. It breaks the week up better. Friday night, you're forced to relax, and it actually makes for a better life. And But that's hard for other people to understand. Yeah. So. We've got 12, 11 minutes, yes. Ken, okay. and you've got Sorry. two more pages of this thing. To, yeah. we're, we're halfway through. I, think I, I know, <laughs> because you, you, you keep asking me crazy stuff. That okay. All these important questions. Yes, all the important questions. Right to the there. heart of the lesson. Okay. <laughs> Hebrews 9. And in Romans 6 and other places, it makes it very clear that covenants, or many covenants at least, are, are based on the idea of a will. And when do a wills come into effect? On the death. When that person who made the will dies. And before that, it has no authority whatsoever. So Paul says, let's look at an example here. Christ made this, God made this promise to us. When does the promise come into effect? When Christ dies. In Daniel, doesn't it say that the covenant will be sealed? Mm -hmm. And doesn't that point to the death of Christ, that Christ sealed the covenant when he well, died? Well, not just in Daniel. There's other places where it talks about that as well. Okay. Yeah. So God is saying there's some kind of an agreement here that's going to be settled based on our the time when Jesus will live and die. Now, we have talked about what was accomplished by the death of Jesus on many previous occasions. We don't have time to discuss it now. But the questions were answered in the great controversy by the life and death of Jesus. And that means now God can fulfill his side of the covenant. He has to, answer, he has to deal with Satan's accusations and his lies before he can move on to save sinners. The, the great controversy can't come to an end until everyone has a chance to see and make a choice one side or the other. God is not going to God is not going to wind things up until that is somehow settled. So that needs to happen. So um, maybe looking. settle and it makes winds it up. Yeah. And we are to trust that God is faithful in fulfilling his covenant. Look, look, look again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to another quotation from Melvin White. This is Steps to Christ, page 28 and 29. See if this describes you or anybody that you know. We may have flattered ourselves, as did Nicodemus, that our life has been upright, that our moral character is correct, and think that we need not humble the heart before God, like the common sinner. But when the light from Christ shines into our souls, we shall see how impure we are. We shall discern the selfishness of motive, the enmity against God that has defiled every act of life. Then we shall know that our own righteousness is indeed as filthy rags, and that the blood of Christ alone can cleanse us from the defilement of sin and renew our hearts in his own likeness. Okay, there's some more long term, some more sort of dark speech. What does that mean? We're not as good as we think we are. Okay. Well, and, and let's, let's make a few things very clear. How many of us are sinners? Don't everybody raise your hand all the same. All but all of us are sinners. Ecclesiastes 7.20, uh, Romans 3.23, those are a couple, a couple of places where it's most... And so as, there, as sinners, what do we deserve? Death. We deserve death. We sh as far as we're concerned, we never should have been born. Yeah. That's true. That all should have ended in the Garden of Eden there with yeah. Adam and Eve. We deserve the second death where we are extinguished, right? Not just the first death, the yeah, second death. Exactly. So um, does the death of Jesus pay for our sins? How does this covenant work? Uh oh, you better explain this. <laughs> Nobody has to oh, be born. <laughs> no, but there's so many times. Gordon, speak up. Yeah, Tell us yeah. the answer. <laughs> 
But I'm, yeah, it it's... It does not pay. <laughs> well, you see, if, if you just said, okay, we don't have to do anything at all, Jesus paid the whole price, then everybody should be saved. Let's all march into heaven, right? That's what some churches do say. Yeah. Or does understanding the life and death of Jesus Christ and the character and government of God as revealed through the life and death, his life and death, make us change our attitude toward God, come to trust him, and want to follow his will for our lives as much as possible. Absolutely. So that would be a major change, right? Yes. Now, many of our Christian friends regard this covenant as involving some kind of a legal transaction. Mm -hmm. Is this a legal transaction? No. I think it was illustrated that way once and they just held on to the illustration yeah that's, that's so. true it may be easy to understand when you look at it like that yeah. if i if i can come go back to like before we talk about you know the meaning of the mind but the second part also is um in lord as consideration i give you something you give me something to make a binding contract mm -hmm. but so in this part we have to do something we have to respond to the call Mm -hmm. And basically, that, that's the only way I understand yeah. it. Well, we're told in the book Desire of Ages, page 131, and a number of other places, that when we get to heaven, we're going to take off our crowns and we're going to cast them at the feet of Jesus. Why would we do that? Because he's the one that earned our crowns for us by living through us. Okay. In other words, it's a recognition of everything he's done mm -hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. Could we actually begin today to experience that kind of thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us? We are supposed to. I would think, yes, we're supposed to. Be. Remember the famous verse, a lot of Christians think this is a, the key to the gospel, Ephesians 2, 6, In our union with Christ Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. I mean... Is that talking about now or some future time? Sounds like it's now, doesn't it? We have a member of our human race now sitting on the right hand uh, in mm -hmm. the throne in heaven. Mm -hmm. And he is a human. So. Okay. So our representative is there. Well, how does that fit with um, what Jesus said in John 5, 24? I'm telling you the truth. Those who hear my words and believe in him who sent me have eternal life. They will not be judged but have already passed from death to life. Is that suggesting to us that it's possible for us to live that kind of a life even now, today? Oh. I mean, and let's, let's, maybe I'm not making myself, myself perfectly clear. What we really want to say here is this covenant, this agreement with God, can we claim it right now? Yes, and it yeah. sure would be nice to have examples. So and so is doing this, and so and so, and so yeah. and so, so we can look at those people. And you know, say, I, I think that's the problem. We're looking at so and so, and so and so, and so and so, uh, when you should be saying that these people have Jesus in them. This has Jesus yeah. in them. They have Jesus in them, and I can tell that they have Jesus is in them because they're doing such and such and such. If we can, that's very good. If yeah. we can, if we can, if we can do that. Mm -hmm. Then why do we, going back to page one of the, of the lesson notes you prepared here, then why do we have to depend on the merits of Jesus that are offered to all who claim those merits by faith? Or do okay. we? Or do we? Or do we what? Or do we have to depend well, on Well, our, our lesson, I will tell you what the lesson suggests is one way we show that we want to take advantage of God's agreement is we keep the Ten Commandments and that means we worship on the seventh day Sabbath. Well, but we can't keep those. Isn't things. that proof that we're saved? We keep the Sabbath? Yeah, that's the Jews. Yeah. Sabbath keeping, tithe paying, health performing Jews went out and crucified Jesus and rushed home to keep you the mean Sabbath. Sabbath keeping isn't a guarantee that we'll be saved? Absolutely not. Well, how broadly are God's covenants supposed to apply? Aren't they available to everybody? Everybody, yes. We haven't mentioned love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. We've got to be working on this. You can claim the promise, but we're expected mm -hmm. to 
that we Try and live turn with. ourselves around with God's help. Our Roman Catholic friends believe that we are saved by merits. Now, the more modern Catholics would sort of maybe speak less about this, but that was a very traditional belief. <coughs> what does that mean? The idea that is that when God judges your life, he balances your bad deeds with your good deeds to see whether you have earned salvation. Thus, if you think you do not have enough good deeds to meet the goal, you can pray to the saints who have excess merits. They can share some of those merits with you so you look better in the judgment. Of course, Jesus has the most merits. You recognize that because he has no bad deeds to balance his good deeds. He has only good deeds. He must have a lot of excess merits, right? What is the relationship between claiming the merits of Jesus and faith? Well, we've got a lot. We've had a lot of questions in this lesson, and and a lot of dark speech, and not not a lot of very obvious answers. Um, how many examples can you think of where we humans have broken our covenant with God? Lots of them, all through the Bible, right? Is there a possibility that God will renege on His side of the covenant because we've done such a bad job? Romans 3, read verses 1 to 4. I don't have time to read them right now, but it says, even if every single human being fails God, he will not fail. His promise, he will keep his word even if all of us fail. So, we think about the covenants. We've talked about how the covenant was cut in ancient times. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant in Abraham's day. It was an outward sign of an inward attitude and commitment. That's what it was supposed to be. What does God want of the covenant of us today? Could, should the outward observance of the seventh day Sabbath be a sign of an inward agreement and understanding in our day? Are there other outward signs that would hint to us that there's an inward attitude? It's that, remember, you, you, you gave me a bad time about Jeremiah 31. God said, the thing I really want is what? Your heart. I really want to see you have an understanding of the law, an understanding of the agreements that says, I will do this because I like to. I, I see why it's a good idea. I want to be like you, God. Please let me share this covenant with you. And I hope that uh, that will be the experience of each one of us. Thank you for watching.